Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I am Vasilis Papakostadino. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Hellenic Innovation Network. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to another stimulating discussion organized by the Hellenic Innovation Network in collaboration with the Greek Consulate in Boston and uh, the MIT Prize Forum, uh, Greece. Today, we focus the discussion on Greek scale-ups, one of which, at least as far as I know, will be joining uh, NASDAQ next month. Our goal is to present more companies like this in the years to come. I'm sure that some of these companies will be members of the 170 plus strong alumni of the MIT Enterprise Forum uh, Greece Startup Acceleration Program. Companies like Augmenta, which raised uh, 8 million recently through their series A round. So let me give you a quick update uh, for the current cohort. This year, we have 31 companies uh, spread in three tracks, energy, maritime, and general. The teams uh, have attended the series of demanding workshops on topics ranging from business and strategy to leadership, legal negotiations, and marketing. Last week, uh, the flagship program, the Perfect Pitch, took place, and now the teams are working on a one-to-one -one basis with our partner, Linda Plano, to get ready for the forthcoming Perfect Pitch Night, which will take place in early May. Uh, during this event, the teams will have the opportunity to pitch to a selected group of investors and, and business partners. Essentially, they would be practicing for the second judging round that will take place in late May, and it will help us choose the finalists. The finalists will continue uh, with a few more workshops on more specialized topics like investment readiness. And the finals uh, most probably will take place in a physical format in late June, of course, with all the precautions. In order to celebrate the effort uh, the finalists put uh, over the course of these months and, you know, uh, their, uh, and, and, and enjoy the future they will create. Uh, the 2021 cohort uh, has some great teams from Greece, Cyprus, UK, US, uh, and Poland, working on different fields from software and hardware to functional food, mixed reality, renewable energy, materials, biotech, uh, to name a few. I'm really excited. Uh, I cannot wait to see their growth in the years to come. If you want to learn more about the teams, please go to mitfgreece.org to, uh, to meet the teams. Now, I would like to welcome Samadhi Astra, a member of the advisory board of the Hellenic Innovation Network, to say a few things about the organization in today's session. Samadhi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Vasily. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening. Uh, the Hellenic Innovation Network, an outgrowth of uh, MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, is a US-based nonprofit organization which was created with the support of the Consulate General of Greece in Boston to catalyze an active dialogue between global tech hubs and the Greek technology community. We want to facilitate access to valuable resources, best practices, and partnership opportunities. Our mission is to accelerate technological innovation and entrepreneurship in Greece by leveraging the Greek diaspora. We want to aid the establishment of Greece as a world-class innovator by 2030. The Hellenic Innovation Network disseminates Greek startup news to its network, broadcasts educational webcasts, organizes regular meetings of a CEO group, and hopefully soon again, we will host in-person on pitching and networking events, which are all open to the community. Now I would like to pass the microphone to our Consulate General of Greece, Mr. Stratos Efthimiou, who has been very supportive in all our efforts and the startups. Many thanks, uh, uh, Samati and Vasily, and of course, uh, Marina. Uh, welcome, dear friends. Uh, this year, uh, all the events of the Hellenic Innovation Network are under the auspices of Greece 2021. Uh, our goal is to ignite a discussion on innovation, the revolution of tomorrow. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kostas Fragoyanis, uh, the Deputy Minister for Economic Diplomacy and Openness, who honors us with his uh, presence. The Deputy Minister has been helpful from day one, supporting our science diplomacy initiatives and uh, Boston was on one of his first trips abroad in September 2019 when we uh, organized an innovation event at uh, Workable here in Boston and Workable is a startup which became a scale-up. Uh, the Deputy Minister 
uh, brought to the foreign ministry his extensive experience uh, from the private sector, and he has been working on attracting FDI and repositioning Greece in the global investment map. One uh, emblematic success was the decision by Volkswagen to proceed to a major investment on the island of Astipala, which will become a model for a smart emission-free uh, mo mobility. Without further ado, I welcome uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, Mr. Fragoyanis, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Well, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to take part in this uh, uh, special moment in uh, time. Um, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. I think that I will start my intervention by emphasizing the closeness and pride I feel whenever I think of Boston. My visits there were a turning point for my work here at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in many ways. I was extremely fortunate to actually see economic diplomacy at its best in practice, and for this, I am forever grateful. Actually, what happened after that is that I became more persistent in my goal to formulate an actual policy economic diplomacy for the Greek state, structures, and institutions that uh, wouldn't go away if I did. My aim was a new, modern, and outward-looking diplomatic model with the purpose of activating forces throughout the world. My idea to establish scientific diplomacy at the ministry was surely the result of the work I saw already being done by the Greek Consulate of Boston with the tireless Stratos of the the Hellenic Innovation Network, and MIT Enterprise Forum Greece. So where are we now? Let me give you a brief overview of the current situation. Despite the COVID pandemic, Greece actually recorded a 3.2% increase of exports. What also happened was a drastic increase in online commerce, of course. Boosting exports and attracting investments is what our ministry is all about. We are aiming to increase exports to 48% of our GDP by 2023 up from 37% in 2018. We continuously exhibit openness in the competitive global scene, making good use of our extensive network of commercial attaches. We have already planned some 60 different initiatives in the next few months to make Greece look outwardly in an unprecedented fashion. A dedicated agency, Enterprise Greece, is involved not only in attracting investments, but also in boosting up our exports, something further supported by the Government Organization for Export Credit Insurance. This last organization, OIEP, we call it in Greek, will be completely revamped. We worked with the best of the best, the Italian leader Sace, in order to come up with a new business and organizational model, a five-year strategic development plan, and much wider range of services and products offered and the new information system. Our greatest achievement, however, has to do with institutional reforms within Greek government structures. The recent legislation now ensures that all government entities related to our international economic presence are roofed under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That is Enterprise Greece, all economic and commercial diplomatic attaches, government services for bilateral and multilateral relations, all supervised by a dedicated Minister for Economic Diplomacy and Openness, and of course, a General Secretariat for the same purpose. We also run a series of activities having to do with their training of our exporters, and especially training related to digital skills, digital roundtables, and business-to-business -business meetings. We started with the eExports Academy, and we recorded exceptional response from over 625 companies. A deal between Enterprise Greece and eBay was realized, one that enhances Greek enterprises through their digital transformation and their promotion globally to 200 markets around the world on eBay's successful platform. A Greek e-pavilion is underway, especially designed to promote Greek products, while there will also be a special participation page in Greek. 
As I'm representing the Greek government as a whole, let me briefly mention Elevate Greece, which is the wonderful initiative by my colleague and friends at the Ministry of Development and Investments, Dr. Christos Dimas, assigned with the research, innovation, and technology portfolio. Launched last October, Elevate Greece is a digital portal aimed at strengthening and developing Greek startups by connecting them with the investors and partners and formalizing the ecosystem happenings in one place. The platform also serves as a development hub for the startups growth, recording their progress on the basis of critical indicators. If you visit the site today, you will find that there are 211 startups already registered, 301 startups that have raised funds, investments of 2.4 billion euros, and 100 plus community builders. The National Startup Awards, rewarding startups for developing innovative products or solutions from scalable enterprises and creating prospects for entering global markets, have also been established. In addition, in mid-March, the European Commission approved the Greek Development Ministry's 60 million euros invitation for support, which is addressed to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises affected by the pandemic. Elevate Greece is proud to have created the first startup database, mapping the innovation ecosystem by monitoring the number of startups per region, processing statistical data, and analyzing the performance of Greek startups through the use of KPIs, such as their annual turnover and funding received by the enterprises. Talking about funding, let me elaborate a bit more on that topic. Right now in Greece, there is a wide range of funding opportunities, whether it is by using structural funds from the 2021 to 2027 NSRF, that's the National Strategic Reference Framework, virtual, um, I'm sorry, venture capital funds or angel investors. And there is a state aid incentive scheme for strategic investments, fast track procedures, coupled with a competitive tax relief scheme for R&D investments. Plus, on top of that, only last week, on March 31st, the Greek government revealed the so-called National Recovery Plan, dubbed ELADA 2.0, Greece 2.0. To implement its plan, Greece will be requesting the total funds it is eligible for from the European Union, the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, 17.8 billion euro of subsidies and 12.7 billion euro in loans actually mobilizing a total of 57.4 billion euros for use. Funding will thus be channeled into four key areas. Digital transformation, boosting employment and enhancing health, education, and social cohesion, the green economy, and attracting investments. We are aiming to increase direct foreign investment to 4% of our GDP in 2023 from just 1.8% of 2019. We have a good record so far. Pfizer, the US pharmaceutical, chose Thessaloniki as the site of one of its global digital hubs, a high-tech facility which is already functioning. Microsoft Corporation announced its GR for Growth initiative, a grandiose plan that includes building new data centers and establishing a Microsoft Cloud uh, in Greece. This will constitute the largest investment Microsoft has made in the 28 years the company has been operating here. My team here at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, along with four other ministries, are currently working very hard with Volkswagen to develop the so-called smart and sustainable island project on Astipalia. The island will be the model for climate neutral immobility leading to an era of smart solutions and green power generation. The last of investments that I would like to mention is about Next Ego Mobile, which is a European manufacturer of battery electric vehicles, which signed a letter of intent with Enterprise Greece, marking the first step for the creation of a full scale manufacturing facility with an initial production of up to 30,000 vehicles per year. On the innovation front, another recent initiative taken by the Greek government is the creation of the, an innovation hub on the premises of the old factory Hropi in the area of Athens, a very central and very convenient location. This abandoned property is sure to create synergies for innovation, hosting business, 
research and development departments, startups, researchers, and academia in an area of almost 18,000 square meters. At the same time, there is an array of initiatives where private industries are working with the Greek government. One example will be the New World New Skills program run by PricewaterhouseCoopers, providing startups with skills that will help them remain viable through sophisticated webinars held in Greek. 2020, my friends, was a year of unusual uncertainty and three big forces that are shaping the modern world change trajectory. Globalization seems to have taken a pause. The geopolitical rivalry between America and China has intensified and the digital revolution has been radically accelerated. This proved to be somewhat of a silver lining amid the crisis, especially for a country like Greece, where digital was still not really a household word a few years ago. Actually, the pandemic compressed years worth of transformation into a few months, changing so much from remote working to online retailing. We are doing well in this front, and I'm very confident that this crisis will bring many opportunities to our country that will quickly be back on track, having been rebranded in the past 20 months as a country that welcomes investments, provides stability and security, and leapfrogs forward. Before closing, I would like to say something about the other guests on this specific panel. I think that the best thing for the Greek government to do, or for any government to do for that matter, is to actively listen to people like the ones joining me today. When I think of these people, Alex Hadzielefteriou from Blue Ground, Dimitris Tsinkos from Epignosis, Kostas Chaousis from NetData, and George Palikaras from Metamaterial, I actually uh, am, uh, am in awe. What they have accomplished is phenomenal. Blue Ground has raised a total of $78 million in equity funding and aspires to growing its portfolio to 50,000 apartments from 3,600. When, when I look at the beautiful places offered, I am tempted to move out of my own home and join you as you have me totally convinced that what you're offering is exactly what you say, beautiful places that people love to call home. With epignosis, what a perfect Greek international world that is, I have felt that the process of democracy, so, so appropriately identified with Athens and Greece, is now being applied to the process of learning. With 11 million learners and 3 million courses over 70,000 portals, Epignosis is truly the leading software solutions provider that has democratized learning, making it accessible and affordable to organizations and companies worldwide. And then there is NetNada. I think it's making all kinds of lists. The definitive guide of cloud monitoring tools for 2021 the seven best cloud monitoring tools for perfect cloud management and the Forbes Cloud 100 rising stars that recognize 20 startups on the cutting edge of the industry. With 52,000 GitHub stars, thousands of new users every day and a user base of over 4 million, NetData is proving to be a distributed systems health monitoring and performance troubleshooting platform for cloud ecosystems of choice. Last, but surely not least, a few words about George Palikaras from Metamaterial. The engineering of materials with properties not found naturally is, of course, wow, inspiring. And I'm hoping that one day George will sit down with me and explain some of the benefits of photonics in a clear and practical way. I'm also interested in hearing about some of the startups he has had with over 150 patents and what his personal 30 patents of which he is named inventor involved. Lastly, special thanks to Vasilis Papakostadinou and Stamatis Astra for the introduction, and of course, Marina Hatsopoulos, the hostess of this panel. She is an inspiration for all of us, combining acute entrepreneurial skills, a solid scientific background, and the sensitivity of an accomplished writer and motivational speaker. Actually, I'm hoping that your knowledge, expertise, and experience will be put to good use by all of us here in Greece, and that many more like you will follow in the near future. Thank you so very much for your attention, and I wish you the very, very best in this session today. Wow. 
Thank you so much, Deputy Minister. That was incredible and so exciting to hear all of the plans that you have in place and uh, what you've already um, done. Um, I would like to invite the other panelists to turn on their cameras so we can see them. And um, this is, uh, as you say, just an, an incredible group of entrepreneurs. So I would like to ask them if they have any questions for you um, about uh, what the plans are for the government. Do any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask the deputy minister while we have him? Yes, Marina, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, excellent presentation, uh, minister. Uh, we are all very excited to be supporting uh, the next chapter for the Greek economy and invest in Greece. I would love to hear what are your current plans from an embassy perspective um, with foreign trade and connecting, for example, the trade commissioner service, supporting both inbound and outbound uh, business uh, strategies. Thank you. Thank you, George, for the question. Um, there is uh, four ways in which uh, we can bring the business communities from one country to another in contact with each other. Um, first of all, uh, there is a number of uh, commercial attaches in more than 150 locations all over the world in embassies and consular, consul general offices uh, throughout the planet. Uh, these people, together with uh, the Office of Economic Diplomacy in our headquarters in Athens, work closely towards bringing the two together. Second uh, agency, the, the official trade and invest agency of the country, which is Enterprise Greece, is very supportive towards uh, Greek businesses that wish to internationalize themselves, whether it is uh, uh, related to exports or it is related to uh, joint ventures, associations, representation, whatever that is, they, they, they are welcome to, to take part in, in the business endeavors of uh, Enterprise Greece together with the uh, uh, commercial attaches of, uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thirdly, we employ just about any imaginable solution towards bringing the two uh, communities together virtual roundtables, business to business meetings, um, taking part in digital fairs. Uh, we've gone to the point of uh, giving the opportunity to small businesses and startups take part in expensive and sophisticated uh, uh, portals and uh, selling platforms such as uh, uh, eBay and Alibaba uh, in order to access the big markets in which these platforms are present. And finally, through scientific diplomacy, we give the opportunity for the academic community and the scientific community to come in contact with the business community on both sides of the Atlantic. So you will be seeing plenty of it. And I just wish to stress that um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is not a productive ministry. It is not tourism, it is not health, it is not energy. So we work across the line with all ministries of the government. And our role is to play a coordinative role in as far as bringing the business communities, whether it is related to tourism or to startups or to um, uh, health or to defense or to whatever that may be uh, with uh, the appropriate bodies to, uh, to complete their mission and, and, and realize their plans. Can I Thank ask you. a question as well? Oh, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for being here today. Uh, I would like to ask you if uh, you are considering any program of startup visa for Greece. Uh, I have in mind that there is great talent in cities like Cairo or like Beirut that would love to move to Athens and join uh, great companies that are created there. And uh, a kind of a startup visa program would really help such an initiative. Uh, the answer is very simple, Mr. Tsikos. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I asked myself uh, whether you have planned a microphone in my office uh, <laughs> because only yesterday we had a meeting uh, that is related to the type and number and, and kinds of visas that we will be offering for a number of reasons, including uh, startups and young professionals who wish to 
become digital nomads and make it to, to Greece? So the answer is yes, we are working on it. And very soon you will hear some very promising and good news related to that. I also have a question to Mr. Palikaras. Uh, you seem to be standing before the Golden Gate Bridge. And I just want to ask, uh, are you in San Francisco? Um, I'm personally on the other side of the coast. We actually have a similar bridge in Halifax, Nova Scotia. However, my company has offices in Silicon Valley. So I'm kind of back and forth between the coasts. And hopefully um, we can bring some of that technology over to Greece very soon. Well, you just made me homesick, sir, because I spent seven years in San Francisco and a little bit of my heart is there. So... Uh, Amazing place. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister. I can't thank you enough. Um, and we hope at our next in-person event to see you in the flesh. Looking forward, Marina. Thank you, Stratos. Thank you all. Big, uh, big success in your endeavors today and in your discussions. I sincerely hope that soon we will be meeting each other in person. All the best. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, we're gonna move now um, to our panelists. And just to give you a brief overview and context about um, who these entrepreneurs are and where their uh, companies are at what stage. Um, first of all, we all know that startups, uh, most startups fail. And so to get to the stage that these startups are is really a tremendous accomplishment. While there's huge startup fever in Greece, these are the entrepreneurs that have gotten through that phase and are now scaling up their businesses. So it's really amazing. To give us some context, let's just go around Alex, George, Costa Dimitri in that order. Um, tell us what does your business do and how big is it? A sense of scale, either revenues or employees. Sure, uh, Marina, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, great to hear the deputy minister also welcoming the digital nomads that do probably stay in one of our one of our apartments when they come to Athens. So what Blue Ground does, we offer beautifully designed and fully equipped um, apartments for stays of 30 days or longer. We're active in uh, 14 cities around the world, uh, in the US, Europe, and Middle East. And in terms of size, we have about 380 uh, people that in, are in the team and our revenue run rate is about $100 million. Amazing. George? Thanks, Marina, for hosting us. Uh, it's great to be amongst uh, such esteemed uh, entrepreneurs. So I'll start by explaining what we do. Uh, so every, with every great advancement in uh, human history, we can attribute it to a breakthrough in material science. If you think about uh, Silicon Valley, this 60 years ago was attributed to the invention of silicon and semiconductor materials and how to manipulate them. So at Meta, we are a new type of material scientist uh, type company where we are leading the revolution of smart nanomaterials with the caveat that we do not anymore need to use rare earth and precious metals. And our products are used across aerospace, telecoms, consumer electronics, automotive, medical, and clean tech. We are a global clean tech 100 company today with 60 people getting ready to uplist on the NASDAQ next month um, with about a $300 million market cap approximately. Very impressive. Costa? Hi, uh, impressive, impressive panel and uh, amazing uh, introduction so far. Uh, so in the data, uh, at the data, we are trying to simplify monitoring, uh, servers monitoring, computer monitoring, cloud monitoring for most of the world. Uh, most of the engineers around the world struggle with monitoring, monitoring and I think uh, we have a pretty unique uh, proposal for them. Uh, so far, we have uh, amazing traction, so we enjoy more than 10,000 new users every 24 hours. Uh, more than a half a million downloads every day. Uh, we are the, more, the fourth most art project in uh, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, we are 50 people. Uh, we have raised so far 35 million uh, from uh, Silicon Valley and uh, Israel uh, and Greece, of course. 
uh, and uh, we are all working remotely before and after COVID <laughs> in 20 time zones. <laughs> Yeah, crazy, crazy times. Crazy Thank time. you, Costa. Dimitri? So, hello, everybody. I'm Dimitri Tsingos, co-founder at Epignosis. It's a great pleasure to be here in very good company. So, the mission of Epignosis is to develop learning technologies for the enterprise. We help companies of any size to educate and train their employees, but also people around them. It's not a new company. My co-founder, Thanos, and I started back in 2003, so it's been a very long journey, uh, but we are very happy to say that currently we have more than 10,000 actually uh, customers, paying customers all around the world. We have added more than 2,000 customers since the marketing brief for this event uh, was written. So uh, oh. the business is growing very, very nicely. Um, what makes Epignosis an interesting company is that uh, 2020 was our 11th year in a row of profitability. So from 2010 to 2020, we have 11 years in a row that we are profitable with um, an EBITDA margin in the likes of 50% of these years. Um, this year, we forecast um, an annual recurring revenue in the range of 40 million US dollars. Um, we are around 140 people right now, most of them in Athens um, and few of them in, in other hubs around the world. And we are really, really optimistic the world's economy is becoming more and more knowledge intensive, and we think that democratizing learning is a very interesting thing to do right now. So looking forward to a very constructive conversation. That's great. I mean, that is something that I've noticed in Greek startups, um, because oftentimes the lack of funding 10 years ago or 15 years ago, these companies had to become profitable very young. And so it's amazing to see that um, in such a young business. Um, okay, you've each kind of semi answered my next two questions. So whichever one you haven't answered, um, if you could talk about how much money you've raised from where and your market cap, or if you've already talked about that, um, talk about your presence in Greece. Alex, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, we've raised a total of $78 million from uh, a number of venture capital funds uh, in Europe and, and the US. This includes Westcap, Prime Venture and Venture Friends. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this, this has been uh, instrumental in terms of kind of expanding in different markets and use that capital to develop our technology, but also launch additional markets. Uh, and you mentioned a little bit before about capital efficiency that has been really big focus for us. Uh, when compared to other players in the space, I think that's where Blue Ground really um, assigned in terms of being more efficient, expanding, uh, uh, going going further with less capital. In terms of our presence in, in Greece, we have about half of our team uh, located there. And we our product engineering teams, accounting finance, and a number of other functions are focused there. And then we have operations in all the markets we're active. So that's in the US and Europe and the Middle East. And uh, we need to have kind of local uh, teams where we, uh, as you know, we operate all these apartments. So that's, that's a, a necessary um, aspect of our business. Uh, of course, Greece is really key for us. I mean, that's where we launched. That's where we pro we've proven the model. And uh, today it's still one of the most successful markets we have. So we're really relying on continuing increasing the team over there. And uh, that remains like a cornerstone of the business. Thank you. George? So from my side, um, uh, I didn't mention where we're headquartered. So we actually started our company in the UK. This is where all the three Greek co-founders met. Uh, my other co-founder, uh, Themos Kalos, has a PhD from, in plasma physics from University of Southern California. We have a guy who studied not too far from you, Marina, at uh, uh, Northeastern University mm -hmm. in Boston. So we all met in London, started there. We wanted to uh, work in Greece uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but the last 10 years has been uh, quite difficult, especially for a nanotechnology kind of company. So we had to always have a global uh, outlook. We expanded west. So we first expanded in Canada where we moved our headquarters in Halifax on the East Coast. Uh, and then we expanded again in Silicon Valley. Uh, so we acquired two companies as a private company. 
went public last year on the Canadian Junior Exchange. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, next month we're uplisting, we're in the final stages on the NASDAQ. Very exciting journey so far. Mm -hmm. And we have raised uh, just over $80 million US um, from Series uh, Seed to Series A, then went public. And we have uh, recently raised um, just over 20 million in the, in the last round. From a, a percentage of the team being in Greece, so we are in the process of establishing, and this is kind of the news that I wanted to share with uh, everyone here today, a special announcement that Athens is gonna become our uh, headquarters for Europe for sales and for a digital R&D center. And in that new space, uh, we plan to have both our 5G applications, but also our entire software team which involves uh, machine learning and uh, deep data. And we are going to be working uh, through a portal that um, Endeavor Greece, which is one of the things that we belong to. Uh, it's called workintech.gr um, and they are helping us establish our jobs and look for talent in Greece. So we estimate a 10 to 15% of our team to be located there by year end. And so uh, we're very excited about that and looking forward to any support that uh, the consulate and Endeavor Greece can offer us in that uh, establishment. Fantastic. Costa. I, I'd like to, uh, no, if Costa wants to. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Maybe. No, I'd like to make a more general remark about funding. So if you guys, I mean, search about epignosis, you will find out that we have not made public announcements about our funding. Uh, it is known to the market that epignosis Recently, 2017 and 2018, we raised two big growth equity rounds, a little bit, a little bit less than blue ground perhaps, but really big for the Greek standards. And actually from very prominent uh, US um, growth equity firms, probably the largest uh, growth equity uh, firm in software around the world. However, there is some reason that we do not focus on this too much because we really think that um, especially young entrepreneurs should not focus too much on funding. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you ask young people, they, they think that funding is the highest, the largest problem they have. However, we found out the hard way that knowledge is much more important than funding. So uh, our growth investors have invested in 350 companies. If we focus conversation on that, we are yet another of 350 companies. But if you look at financial profile, it's a very rare, mm -hmm. a unique profile. So I'd like to invite young people and mm -hmm. uh, younger of any age, you know, new entrepreneurs, uh, instead of you know focusing on the lack of capital. And uh, Mr. Fragogan said that currently there is no lack of capital in Greece. There is plenty of capital. You know, there is knowledge out there, there's lean startup, agile, customer development, design thinking, knowledge is public, and it all takes creativity and teamwork. So I think we should focus on that. Younger people should focus on this and, you know, get as much funding as you need, but no more than that. Don't I think that's... Over focus on the funding. Uh, I think that's a very good point. I mean, I know here in the US, it's very much a figure of merit, how much you've raised. And that becomes the end point when really that's just your starting point. That's just- It's a getting... means to an end. It's not an end itself, right? Exactly. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, Costa, I, by the way, Costa, you have the most beautiful background of anyone. So- Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I am in Athens at Plaka. Yeah, that's oh, a, gorgeous. A, a working space we have here. So- okay. Uh, as I said, the data has uh, raised uh, 35 million so far. We are at Series A, Seed and A, um, from uh, Bain Capital uh, on, at, uh, at San Francisco, uh, Marathon here in Greece, and uh, Bessemer from Israel. Uh, we have uh, about, uh, so let's say half of our people are Greeks, 40% of them are working in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, totally remote, so we don't have uh, a, a headquarters anywhere. Um, our uh, post money valuation the, of the last round is $102 million. But, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with Dimitris. The, all these figures are not, are not important. And, uh, you know, if, if there is strong knowledge and uh, a, a good product, 
uh, I think there are plenty of money out there for every every uh, need uh, for every <laughs> uh, project. Uh, yes, that's great. Um, so let me ask, this is an open-ended question for any of you, um, and you don't all have to answer, but um, my question is when you're scaling the business, what is the hardest element? What's, what's keeping you from going faster? If I said, I want you to grow twice as fast as your current budget, what's, what's keeping you from doing that? I can take that. Sure. So unlike my fellow speakers, we are in the hardware business mm -hmm. and hardware requires manufacturing technologies especially when you're pioneering a field like nanomaterials where sometimes existing technologies are just not good enough or can't scale uh, or just the suppliers don't have the knowledge perhaps so the the minister earlier mentioned that we have 150 patents we are now at 164 to be exact and this ip came uh, through a huge amount of development. We were a handful of people for the first five years, very lean, extremely, let's say, funded by ourselves for a very long time. And then we started getting some traction from customers who invested in our scale up. So for us, uh, it was more about validating this at scale, what we could ma manufacture. And to do that, you need partners. So unfortunately during COVID, um, every single supply chain has been affected. Uh, you may have recently seen in the news that uh, certain aut big automotive companies cannot put in uh, computer chips on their cars and production has, has been halted. So these are the little things that, of course, uh, are very important in a hardware business that you need supply chain management. And no matter how much money you have, you may never be able to just get what you want when you want it to be able to scale and advance and double, as you said, uh, your speed. Alex, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to make a point also um, on the point on, on funding. Actually, uh, I mean, it's true there is available capital in Greece. It is also true, in my opinion, that you will have relatively less capital than, than any competitors in the US. And that's true for Europe versus US, not just Greece. But I think you can actually that can be turned into a positive. So, I mean, in our case, you know, we had to, to grow with less capital. Fast forward after a few years, uh, Blue Ground and its competitors are at scale right now. And we've done much more with much less capital and there are ways around it as Dimitris and Costa mentioned and George. Um, so this is something to, you can, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that you can, you can be more frugal, you can be smarter. And then fast forward a few years later, you actually build a more efficient business that makes more higher returns for the investor. So this is what happened to, to Blue Ground. Um, now going back to the point of growth, in our case, we have a very big um, uh, TAM or addressable market. So it's relatively easy to scale if you put capital and add you know, a new apartment and, and scale the team. They're really, um, and, and we've seen uh, companies in the space not do that effectively by how not selecting the right assets in the right locations, not getting the right deals done. And we had a number of, uh, of companies actually in the US that failed during COVID. And so in our case, yes, you can scale, but um, expanding smartly and not going too fast, um, not being careful uh, where you're going to expand uh, can lead to uh, the opposite effect. So I think for us, it's a balance of uh, selecting the right apartments, selecting the right assets, and working with the, with the right deal structures um, versus just kind of going crazy where we saw that and that can actually backfire. So I'm always in, in when investors are, can you, this is a very common question you get always from investors like, can you do, double, can you triple? And I was like, pause and say, like, no, this is what we can do uh, because if we go faster, it will become sloppier, we'll burn more capital, and then you will not be happy with that. So, and that's also something that entrepreneurs should be careful because sometimes if, you know, if, if a business goes too well and you burn more capital, guess what? You're going to need more capital. So you have to have a balance um, to make sure that you also, uh, you know, get the capital you need to grow fast because you have to generate returns for investors, but also not grow too much and get diluted in, uh, in later rounds. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, I'm curious, how much time pressure do you all feel for getting to a liquidity event? You've made promises to your investors. Um, now there's this craze over SPACs. Are you feeling SPAC mania? Like where, where are you on that timeline? What are you thinking about in terms of liquidity? Can I, can I take that? Yeah. So, so the good news is that, you know, investors can find liquidity, uh, you know, because there is a so big private equity market and we see so many transactions, you know, that um, big private equity firms buy stake from other companies. So the good news is that now, you know, it's not only an acquisition, a strategic acquisition or, a, or an IPO. There are many other ways to provide liquidity uh, to investors that this does not really put a lot of pressure and stress to the founders and to the rest of the company. So at least in Epignosis, we've taken a very long-term approach. We really think there is so much to do. The brightest days are still ahead of us. So we are not even asking the questions to ourselves when there will be a liquidity event, I mean, a total acquisition or something like that. And we are very lucky by the fact that, you know, for the fact that the private equity market, you know, is so active. So our investors can find liquidity whenever they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be good news for everybody in the firm. But mm -hmm. we still have, you know, time ahead to realize our vision. Uh, Marina, one thing I can add here is that, uh, I mean, we have already created a liquidity event for our investors. So mm -hmm. we are already in uh, Canada, at least in a junior exchange, and we are enhancing the liquidity equation via the, the transaction we're doing uh, close to next month. So with the recent SPAC transactions, what, all I can say is that it has created additional interest in our company mm -hmm. because many of them are actually companies that are emerging growth sectors. For example, e-mobility, advanced automotive systems, and these include, believe it or not, the target customers and partners for, for Meta. So their enhanced liquidity actually creates opportunities for us to enable customer acquisition or more basically orders that happen because they have more liquidity themselves mm -hmm. and more capital to grow. So that creates a, a, a kind of an enabling effect for the whole industry. I'm sure many of you may have had the results uh, in, you know, affecting your business being that the SPACs are creating uh, additional capital to go around. And at the end of the day, I feel that uh, two years ago when we made the choice, we had term sheets to go to a series B round. We chose to go um, public because we wanted to also go long as Dimitri said. And for us, because we're in the hardware business, Vendor risk is always a, a big question mark. You are always seen as a startup. And if you're trying to sell to Airbus and Samsung and Sony, those are the kind of customers who will look at your balance sheet and they'll just take a tiny little steps because they have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. And eventually they want to acquire you if you become very strategic. In our case, we are very industry agnostic. Going public was the right thing for us to do. Great. Um, we're starting to get questions from the audience. And so I encourage everyone to send in your questions. Um, but before I ask that, I, I did have a question I wanted to ask you. Those of you with employees in Greece, um, do you give equity to your employees in Greece? And do they value that equity? Is that something people get? Do you give stock options or do you give straight shares? Uh, talk to us about the sort of um, employee incentives. I can, I can answer this. So uh, we have a standard policy that every employee gets uh, RSUs. Uh, uh, the problem with, uh, with the Greeks is that they don't understand. So they accept them, of course, but they don't really understand them. You know, in, uh, for, for the people we have in the US, uh, not only they understand, but they, they also ask questions. Uh, what is this? What's the other? Eh? What's the, it's going to happen? Is it double trigger? Uh, what's going to happen if someone buys the company, etc., etc.? But Greeks, 
uh, unfortunately, they are not used to it. Uh, so we have as a policy to give to everyone, every single employee of the, home, of the company has, uh, but still most of them don't get it, don't, don't understand. <laughs> I so think it, it needs a few iterations for them to make money, for some people to make <laughs> money out of this, and then... <laughs> when they see their friends becoming millionaires, that will, the light will go on. <laughs> exactly. Great. Um, we have a question, unless, does anyone else want to answer? No? Okay. Um, we have a question from Alec Harris, which is, uh, when do you know it's time to move from startup to scale up? So basically, you know, wh what's the difference? What, what, what changes from startup to scale up? What is that sort of uh, inflection point? I mean, oh, please, go ahead. No, a, a very simple approach is that a startup is a company in search of a business model. When the business model actually works, it is evident to the founders. Mm -hmm. So then the scale up phase is starting, you know. So a, a solid validation of, of the business model. And when you cross the chasm, the chasm from the early evangelists to mainstream customers, this is the turning pro point from, um, from a, a startup to a scale up. And founders must be aware of this. I, I think that oftentimes this is happening without even the founders noticing it, you know, mm -hmm. after several pivots. But it's very important to be mindful and to understand when you enter the mainstream market. That's a very, very critical point. Costa, did you want to add to that? Yes. So, um... I would say that uh, we are in a, in a product growth uh, business. So I, I, for, for us, this works in, 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 in phases. So we have one phase that we have proven that we have market fit and we have amazing traction. Then we are going to the next phase where we need to transition people, anonymous open source users to, uh, to uh, subscribers, let's say, but free subscribers again, and then we need to uh, convert people into customers, to pay customers. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, this is a, 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 I think that there is a Greek, uh, a Greek phrase that, uh, you know, where you are running against yourself and you are coming second. Eh? <laughs> this is how I feel. Uh, we are racing against ourselves because we are the only ones that are doing this thing in, in our <laughs> industry. Uh, and in many cases, we struggle with it. <laughs> So uh, the, 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 the fun part of this is that um, in our case, you, we have to do it again and again and again. <laughs> That's a great, I, I didn't know that expression. That's wonderful. <laughs> I think the, the more um, innovative the company, uh, the, the more struggles you have being on that front edge. Um, I have a question for all of you. How easy is it or hard is it for you to find employees in Greece with the right capabilities, training, background, uh, and education that you're looking for? And parallel to that, are you seeing a return to Greece of a lot of young talent that left during the economic crisis? Yeah, let me, let me answer that. Um, we have about 180 people uh, in our Athens offices. Um, yeah, you know, there is great talent in Greece. I mean, very hardworking, super capable. The, they were part of the launching of the business then, and also they followed in the expansion of the other markets. So, you know, really, really, I mean, we had a fantastic experience with hiring Greeks. Um, so I think there are uh, specific areas like engineering product, also on the business side, operational roles. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we've seen these skills play out, uh, both great English uh, fluency and really hard work, great work ethic. Work ethic. Uh, so I think that's definitely a yes. Uh, at the same time, you know, as you expand into new markets, obviously you have to hire locally. You have to di diversify a little bit uh, where you get people. For example, like in the US, we have a big part of the team of uh, doing branding, marketing, communications. Uh, we have in Turkey teams that are doing supply chain, so still our core is, is Greece, but I think as you expand internationally, you need to be pragmatic about, uh, about uh, certain things. So I think that's, that, that's been our experience. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll continue hiring and we see that as our core kind of base. 
as we expand in different markets. And I think the other, other thing is like, especially the team that has been together with the company from the early days, um, you know, they have a different uh, loyalty, a different work ethic, um, it, it, I'm saying it in a good way because they've seen the business come from nothing to something. And, you know, relying on this team is really, really important uh, as you scale up. So yeah, to your question, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a great place to find talent and, and develop the talent as you go. In our case, um, uh, I can say that uh, Greeks are, are amazing, uh, amazing uh, engineers and scientists. Uh, so to, to our experience, you know, there is a Greek word, this Greek word, the, the famous Greek word, philotimo. Mm-hmm. It's very rare to find it anywhere in the world. <laughs> so Greek, Greeks really appreciate uh, when you take care of them and mm-hmm. they try hard to return this uh, favor back to you, which is amazing. And at the same time, uh, although initially we struggled to find skillful people, um, I think that uh, the funding announcements and the publicity uh, they took in, in Greece uh, made really a lot of people uh, seek uh, to, to join us, uh, which is uh, amazing, of course. Now, uh, the, well, of course, there are Greeks uh, and very skillful Greeks all over the world. Uh, we have a few o- o- in, in almost uh, every continent. Um, a few of them seek to relocate and are doing it. Others are not. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's a mix of, uh, uh, you know, what they t- t- tend to do. They, most of them love to have this uh, prospect eh, to, to, to return back, uh, back to Greece, but uh, only a few of them do it. <laughs> Interesting. I'd like to add to that, that uh, there are few people that return to Greece from the generation that left in uh, 2010, mm-hmm. but Uh, By no means, there is no wave yet. There are a few individuals that start. I I wish they will return. However, what is very encouraging, that's why I asked the question about startup visa. You know, in Epignosis, in a small team of 140 people, relatively small in Athens, we have more than 14 nationalities. 14 nationalities. Okay, perhaps one or two persons per nationality, but still you find many people from the broader neighborhood who feel very comfortable to work in Athens. So I'd like to advise entrepreneurs that possibly, you know what, attend us right now that in those hubs, there is great talent and this talent, you know, can very easily relocate to Athens. That's a very big opportunity. That's great. Um, Okay, we got another question uh, from Panayotis, which is, um, what is what are your key takeaway? What are the ingredients to move from startup to scale up? And most critically, can you do it with the same founding team? I think you you need to be ready to take hard decisions. <laughs> so uh, most startups, you know, even we did it. So we have a. Uh, you, you have a year where you, the first year where you try everything. Eh? So whatever you imagine and you are very happy that you raised money and you're, you're building your dream. And suddenly you come down to reality that a few things work and others don't work. So you have to be prepared to take hard decisions. Um, and I think that uh, as an entrepreneur, you always have to be ready for that. Uh, that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, you have to do this uh, while trying to have everyone as happy as possible. That's the whole point. Eh? Uh, maintaining the, 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 best, uh, the best path for the company and at the same time, utilize all resources uh, the best way you can. So, yeah, of course, uh, in some cases, the roles within the, the company, the, the team uh, change. Uh, in other cases, the founding team breaks. So there are all kinds of uh, all kinds of situations out there, all kinds of uh, possible scenarios. Anyone else want to add to that? No. Okay. So um, I have. Oh, Dimitri, did you want to no. say something? Okay. Um, so I have some specific questions uh, for you. So I'll start with Alex. Um, 
So you were talking about uh, capital efficiency, and I think Blue Ground has been really innovative in that regard. Can you talk about how you've shifted the business model um, by having the customers provide some of the financing to make it less capital intensive and therefore easier to scale? Sure. So um, the way we operate, because our business model is full stack. So when I, when I mean full stack, I mean like from uh, the apartment renting to the design, the furnishing, uh, to the entire kind of experience end to end. So that, that aspect of the business, which you need to have in order to provide standard quality supply into the market is capital intensive um, because you need to invest in, in the initial setup of the apartment. And um, what we've done differently than other players, because exactly as you said, we had to be very frugal, we had le much less capital, especially in the early days before even raising the first uh, financing, um, we found ways where we optimized our working capital. So we work with our landlords, um, property owners, to provide the capital to kind of do all the financing and the design uh, by giving them a hefty return on their investment. We work with our guests on the other side to offer uh, plans where they could prepay uh, for better rates. And then in terms of the supply chain, we actually work with the suppliers to get very strong, uh, very good payment terms. And that combination actually turned the cash flow profile of the business for being very demanding in the early days uh, in terms of cash needs to the opposite, right? And that, that's something that actually when you compare Blue Ground to its competitors, and I mentioned this a few times before, but we are as five times as efficient with our capital as others. And that is again, due to the, to the necessity, right? Due to the frugality that we had to, but still, still a lot of capital because we have raised 78 million and I wish we could do it like Dimitris, uh, but you know, it's a different business model. And within that, within our world, you know, that, that's pretty efficient. That's very impressive. Um, George, I'm moving to you. Um, why did you choose to do a reverse merger instead of a SPAC, a direct listing, or an IPO? Thanks, Marina. So as you know, uh, until last uh, spring, March, Meta was a, a private company in Canada. Uh, we were able to secure uh, significant funding and resources from our initial customers, but as well as some uh, government support that... Uh, uh, basically minimize the dilution. So the decision to do our first uh, reverse merger, we have done already one, that's how we entered the Canadian junior market, was intended to be one uh, step of the way, basically to get uh, uplisted on the NASDAQ eventually. So uh, then came COVID and we needed to pivot a little bit. Um, the merger we are now have uh, pending is with a US company already trading on the NASDAQ. Uh, the transaction was agreed back in uh, December last year and we plan to close it next month. Uh, it will bring us uh, additional capital, um, a clean NASDAQ listing and access to uh, a self-registration and ATM. These are technical terms that are about $300 million of new capital. Uh, but more importantly, we will become the first uh, meta material company of our category to be listed on the the world's premier technology exchange and there are many uh, other reasons for example attracting the very top talent uh, with a nasdaq listing uh, it becomes much more um, feasible and the vendor risk that i mentioned earlier on um, made it uh, possible for us to basically list the way that our large customers see us with the NASDAQ listing is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the fastest and cheapest way I could see versus a SPAC that has a, let's say a price tag of about $20 million plus when you start going down that uh, path. Going through an RTO also gave us access to a lot of shareholders. Mm -hmm. So when we initiated this, uh, we had something about 5,000 shareholders between the, the companies we have now in excess of 110,000 shareholders. Wow. And each one of those shareholders is almost like a brand ambassador. Mm -hmm. They have given me ideas that you have, I, I could spend hours talking about because they take a personal interest in the success of the company. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, moving to Costa, you have an incredible, uh, an incredibly impressive customer base, Amazon, Google, IBM. In your early days, how did you earn the trust of these very large companies? So um, the truth is that it happened by itself. So I didn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> the idea is that uh, uh, when I first released the data as an open source software, um, it went viral. So really a lot of people from all over the world. So it's probably the fastest growing project on GitHub. Um, so the, the idea is that really a lot of people from all over the world were pleased with it, uh, used it internally in many, 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 many teams, many companies. Uh, and I think that this is the, this is the strongest uh, uh, proof that you can ever get that you have market fit, eh? that, that you solve a, a, a very um, common problem uh, in this in a market uh, when you see this uh, this this kind of traction. So I think that the traction was it, the virality of it. I just hit a nerve. <laughs> the way I observed monitoring and the way I found that uh, it should be solved yeah. really amazed a lot of people. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, Dimitri, you have a very unique relationship with Epignosis um, in your role at StarTech Ventures. Um, so can you talk about how those two work together? Um, and because it's sort of an unusual um, business model. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me clarify, first of all, that StarTech Ventures is, is not a fund. It's a private company, uh, basically of uh, you know, myself and a few close partners that our mission, you know, is to be a venture builder. Mm -hmm. So our role in Epignosis, like many other, many other companies in our portfolio, we are co-founders and founding investors. So with this venture builder, we have you no, know, our mission is twofold. One thing is to work with exceptionally talented individuals who fall completely outside the stereotypical entrepreneur. And because they are outside this dominant, you know, uh, stereotype of the entrepreneur, uh, they were unlikely to become entrepreneurs. So we are working with exceptionally intelligent uh, people like my co-founder Thanos with Epignosis, my co-founder Manos Moscus with Absorba Games, or Vangeli Michalopoulos with Yodek. And with those people, you know, we really support them to become some of the best CEOs out there. And I'm extremely proud of very, how good CEOs they, they've become. And the second thing with StarTech is that we found it very, we, we, we were, it was uneasy, you know, we were uncomfortable with this dominant opinion that most startups fail, that 90% of the startups have to fail. Why do they have to fail? So with StarTech Ventures, we are trying to master the art and to discover the science of entrepreneurship and make sure that 90% of the startups will succeed at the end. Mm -hmm. So we did not know how to call what we do. It seems that venture building is what we do. And um, uh, we are very happy so far. We have three great successes with Absorba Games, Epignosis, and now Yodek, in my humble opinion, the most promising tech company out of Greece. I'm biased, of course, but it's really, really promising. So, you know, there are six companies that follow. And um, if we manage, you know, to really, we are still halfway, but uh, it's going to be a very interesting Hellenic approach in building sustainable businesses. So this is what we try to do. We are co-founders. That's great. Well, um, we, we have some questions, but um, we're actually running out of time. I'd like to give you each an opportunity to give a sort of brief answer, um, which is what has been your major point of learning in this journey? Some gem of advice that you can give to the startup that's just a few years behind you um, for this, this pivoting, this, this really important inflection point in taking your business to the next level in any order. Can I quickly yeah. give a punchline perhaps? Sure. But I truly believe it. Um, uh, I don't think it matters what size of company you are, you have, or you think you need to be. 
all it matters is the size of the problem that you're solving. So if it's a big enough problem, many people will care about enough to pay for it, to use it, to use the solution that you're building. And that's really the message uh, that uh, we are, you know, working on very hard things. Uh, nanotechnology is difficult, but there's a lot of ups and downs and bumps along the way. And I think resilience is one of those uh, attributes that you need to always think very positively and figure out ways of solving not only the problems for your customers, but whatever other things that you may have uh, internally, whether it's financial, communication, um, and otherwise. And I feel that the resilience is really one of the character, character building things for um, a lot of Greeks that I've met, they never give up. And I feel that's part of who I am and the thing that keeps me going. Who wants to go next? You're all going to have to answer. <laughs> so the last, the last 10 years, you know, they have been uh, written a really lot of articles and books, et cetera, about uh, how to build a startup, a successful startup, how to be, do this or the other. Uh, the, agile, the agile way of working, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, I think that uh, most, of the, most of the lessons end to come to a, common, uh, to a common thing. So at the end of the day, you have to uh, accept uh, failure, that uh, you can learn from failure. And uh, you have to, 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 to seek, um, you know, I, I say inside the company, that we are bug hunters or we're trying to find where the faulty things are. Eh? If you are seeking for the faulty things, then for sure we are you are going to learn. You are going to fix them and learn. Mm -hmm. If you are not looking for them, then you just need luck. <laughs> That's it. So fail fast, uh, uh, be patient and, uh, you know, you are going to do it. It's, uh, that's, that's the message. It's, it's up to you. It's uh, a race against yourself. You can't come second. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Who's next? Dimitri. So if I could say, you know, it, it might sound a little bit radical, but I would say it's all about love. The mission <laughs> of a founder is to create an organization where each and every individual in the organization will have the luxury of loving their work, to love what they do. If they love their work, they will be exceptionally good at it. And will, through their work, through their own creativity, they will make the lives of their customers better. So create an organization, cultivate a healthy relationship based on love. That's my humble advice. Love is the answer. I love it. We need John Lennon here to, with his guitar. Uh, <laughs> Alex, can you? Can yeah. you... So I think uh, for me, to all aspiring entrepreneurs, founders, starting from Greece, um, you know, as I remember, like the first steps I was, uh, were making back then, it's, it's, you don't have many, now it's a bit different, but at the time, uh, we didn't have many entrepreneurial kind of role models, people that, you know, say, okay, you know, these are so many successful people that I actually know that develop businesses, and because we haven't, at least for me, I haven't seen many of those. I didn't, have, I didn't know many of those. It was difficult to kind of like dream big and create a story. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, what you believe your company will be, will probably will be at the end. So for me, uh, starting, if I did not think, that, you know, this could be like such a big business that it is today. And then incrementally, I got there by success after success after success. So I think that's something when you start in Greece, it's like a little bit difficult. Like when you think about, you know, look at the companies starting in the US and now the market is like, how can I possibly like get there? So I think we're kind of self-sabotaging us a, li self -sabotaging a little bit, not by kind of um, thinking um, big from, from the early days. So I think that's something that we need to do more uh, and, and believe in ourselves. So I think that's something that uh, one, one advice. And the second piece for me is, Many times uh, I'm a very rational person, so I want to see like a problem and how I'm going to solve that problem. But sometimes I, you know, I don't see an, an answer to the problem. And there you just have to 
believe that you're going to solve it and believe that you're going to go through it, even though you don't know the answer. And that can be paralyzing for some people. So, and for me as well. But then at some point, at some point, just plunge in it, you just stay there and you just kind of persist to, to George's point, you're resilient and an answer might, um, might come up. So think of a bigger story and be resilient even if you don't have the answer. That's great. Um, all of you, wow, such an honor to be among you and to hear your stories and incredible job. You are all the face of entrepreneurship in Greece and it's so important for everyone to see what's next as they launch their own startups. So thank you all so much for your time today. And um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we can continue this dialogue online on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I think it's so many people are really interested to learn from you. Um, our next event is on May 6th. And um, also MIT Enterprise Forum Greece will be having a panel on um, uh, licensing technology, commercializing technology out of a university environment um, at the Delphi Economic Forum um, in mid-May. So um, please join us for those events and um, thank you all, signing off. <laughs>